Welcome to episode 3 of Sarastro's Zombicide Black Plague painting series. In this episode we're going to paint the Necromancer from Cool Money or Not's Zombicide Black Plague. The Necromancer is a dynamic and somewhat busy miniature, with flowing purple robes and lots of expressive details for us to enjoy painting. It's worth mentioning now that because I want a cleaner, more controlled approach to the colours, I won't be using quickshade for this figure or for the heroes. Let's take a look at the painting stages. We're going to begin by priming the necromancer with a black primer. We'll then apply the base colours and I'll be sticking fairly closely to the illustration in the manual, except for one or two small deviations. Although I'm not using quick shade, I would still like to apply some black and brown shade to select parts of the miniature. We'll then spend a fair bit of time highlighting the figure, and our finishing touches will include painting the eyes as well as one or two decorative elements such as the horns and the gemstone on the belt. Let's jump straight in with the base colours. I'm going to begin by giving the skin a base coat of Bugman's Glow. As always I like to use an old brush to collect some paint and thin it down with a little water. Avoiding the eyebrows here would be helpful. We should also take care not to miss any of the small gaps between the clothing, as well as the small patch of exposed thigh on the left leg. A second layer of this should give us a nice solid finish. Next I'm going to paint the chain we can see hanging from his waist with some lead belcher. We needn't be too neat here, as we will of course be painting the surrounding area later on. I'm now going to mix an equal quantity of black in with the lead belcher, and use this to paint the armour. I'm also using this to paint the metallic adornment we can see on his beard. Next I'm going to use some steel legion drab for the handle of the dagger. I'm also going to use this to provide an undercoat for several areas that I will be painting a pale beige in a moment. These areas include the skulls, and I would avoid the eye sockets when doing this, the rope around the bottles and his waist, and the stitches on the robe. I'm doing this because it's very difficult to achieve good coverage using a pale beige over black. Now when I apply this screaming skull, it will be much easier to achieve good coverage. We still need to apply a couple of layers, but without the brown undercoat we would have needed a lot more.
I'm now going to use a slightly darker beige colour, Carrack Stone, for the wraps that we can see on the necromancer's arms and on the horns. These two are areas that perhaps could have benefited from the brown undercoat. We can also paint the piece of cloth on the end of the staff with this. In my first deviation from the character art, I've chosen to paint the bottles hanging from his belt green, so I'm providing a base colour of Caliban green. And here I'm using some steel legion drab for the corks. For the dagger's pommel and crossguard, I'm using some Mechanicus Standard Grey. I'm now going to use some Rhinox hide for the leather belt, the handle of the staff, and the short leather strap we can see on the chest. For the red sash, I'm using some Mephiston red, darkened with a little Caliban green. I'm now going to paint the beard using Vallejo's German Grey. This can be applied a bit like a highlight in that we don't have to get into every nook and recess since the beard is basically black. I'm also going to paint the eyebrows with this. And I'm going to return to the screaming skull to paint some additional details, which means the necklace around the neck, the earrings, as well as the bone being worn through the nose. For small details like this, I might apply the paint a little thicker than usual. I'm also going to pick out the upper row of teeth with this. Finally, I'm going to paint the robe, and to recreate the dark yet muted purple colour, I'm going to mix roughly equal quantities of Citadel's Zarya's purple with Vallejo's German grey. This gives very nice coverage and will only need one or two layers.
Once we're happy with the base colours, we're ready to add some shade. I'm going to apply two different colours of shade, starting with some neat non-oil, which I'm going to apply only to the chains. These need a good long shake before using, and although they can be used straight from the pot, I usually prefer to transfer some to a palette, as the parts are quite easy to knock over by accident. These shades are designed to settle more into the recessed parts of the miniature than on the raised or flat areas. This makes them ideal for textures like this. These chains are now so well defined that they will need no further work. I'm now going to mix in a roughly equal quantity of Agrax Earthshade, and I'm using this to shade the armour, as well as the skulls, wraps and the various accessories gathered around his waist. This means I'm shading most of the remaining areas of the figure, except for the robes and most of the skin. We needn't worry if we do get some shade on the robes however, as we'll be touching them up before applying the highlights later on. Notice on the armour that the shade not only darkens the areas where it collects the most, but it also mutes the metallic reflectivity, creating yet another form of contrast. I might also apply some of this to the face area. Once that's dry, I might apply a second layer of this to the darker parts of the armour to strengthen the sense of depth and contrast. I'm taking care to avoid some of the highlights that we can now see presenting themselves. Once that's dry, we're ready to apply the highlights. I'm going to begin by highlighting the skin. For this, I will be applying two levels of highlight using Kadian Flesh Tone, followed by the lighter Kislev Flesh. However, I've also chosen to mix a small amount of Nurgling Green into each colour to give the Necromancer's skin a slightly more pallid and sickly tone. So here's my Cadian flesh tone, to which I'm now adding just a small dab of Nurgling Green. This first highlight is going to cover most of the skin, except for areas like beneath the ridge of the pectorals and the gaps between the fingers. As with the Abomination episode, you can find links to some lighting reference shots in the video description below, which you might find useful when deciding where to place your highlights. For the head, I've thinned the paint a little more to increase the translucency. In this more watery state, we can push the paint around a bit, encouraging it to concentrate more on the top of the head. And, by spreading the layer more thinly, we can build up some effective gradients. We shouldn't worry if our first layer of this looks a bit blotchy, as we'll be applying another layer or two once it's dry. Building up the highlights in several thin, semi-translucent layers is a nice easy way to produce generally smoother transitions of dark to light. As well as maxing out the highlight on the top of the head, 
we also need to ensure we hit the top of the nose, the cheekbones and the tops of the ears. Now we can apply the smaller, lighter highlight using some Kizzler Flesh, which, once again, I'm mixing with a little Nurgling Green. Here you can see how thin I sometimes like to make the paint when highlighting larger, flatter areas such as the head. You can also see how drawing the brush upwards helps encourage the paint to collect more at the top of the head, where we want the brightest highlight to be, whilst also providing smoother gradients from the darker neck area. I've decided to push the contrast just a little further by mixing in a little white and providing one final highlight. Once the skin is complete, we can begin highlighting the remaining areas, and I'm starting with the red sash. I'm going to begin the highlights with some Evil Sun's Scarlet, which I'm darkening slightly with some Caliban Green. I'm then going to use some pure Evil Sun's Scarlet. For the final highlight, I'm using some Wild Rider Red. This wants to be used sparingly, just for the brightest points of light. For the green bottles, I'm going to begin by neatening things up with a reapplication of Caliban Green.
I'm then going to mix in a roughly equal quantity of moot green for the next layer of highlight. I'm then going to use some pure moot green. Because this is quite a big step up in brightness, I'm going to be applying it in several thin layers, gradually reducing the area of highlight down to the brightest point. When the paint is quite thin like this, it doesn't take long to dry, and we can quite quickly build up a smooth high contrast gradation without having to mix lots of different shades. For the armour, I'm going to mix equal quantities of Stormhost Silver and Carrick Stone. You could use pure silver here if you wish, although I quite like the subtle tarnished look that the addition of the beige produces, and I find the paint a little easier to handle than when highlighting with a pure metallic colour. As the armour wants to be predominantly dark, I'm applying the highlights quite sparingly, simply enhancing the naturally occurring highlights we can already see being produced by the semi-metallic finish. I'm now going to highlight the skulls with a reapplication of Screaming Skull. The transitions here don't need to be especially smooth, since we might consider these skulls to be pretty old and weathered looking. I'm also going to pick out the bindings on the bottles with this. I've chosen to add a few brighter highlights to the skulls by adding some additional white in one or two stages. For some areas of the miniature, a simple reapplication of the base colour will suffice. So, for the wraps, I'm just reapplying a little Carrick Stone.
Likewise, for the grey parts of the dagger, we can simply apply a small dab of Mechanica's standard grey. For the dark brown areas, such as the belt and the staff, I'm mixing roughly equal measures of the original Rhinox hide with some Mornfang brown. To add a little interest to the staff, I'm creating a slight gradient by pushing more of the paint towards the lower end. I'm also providing a highlight to the rear of the staff. And let's not forget the small leather strap tied to the torso armour. Finally, we're going to highlight the cloak. Before doing this, I'm going to neaten up any scrappy areas with the original Xerius purple and German grey base colour. We can then mix in a little white, or off-white, to begin gently lightening the colour. I've chosen Vallejo's Ivory to do this, which I find gives a slightly less chalky finish than when using pure white. Before I do, however, I'm going to transfer a little of the base colour into a separate well in the palette, in case I need to use it to touch up any mistakes or smooth out any harsh transitions. I'm then adding just a small amount of the Ivory. Once again, for the larger, flatter areas, I'm applying nice thin layers, almost like a heavy glaze, to gently brighten the tone. We can carry on lightening the tone in a couple more stages, reworking the same patches of highlight, but in slightly reducing areas. Sometimes I might apply a thin intermediate glaze to help smooth over any sharp transitions. Here I'm mixing the tone for the brightest highlight. When deciding how bright to go with our highlights, it's worth bearing in mind what kind of surface we are dealing with. For something like shiny metal or leather, we might want to go quite far, but for dark cloth, we don't want to go too bright, tempting though it might be. We 
could then finish the robes off with a dark glaze of either black or black with a little dark purple mixed in. This can be brushed into the recesses in a couple of layers to give the contrast a subtle boost. Once we're happy with the highlights, we're ready for some finishing touches. I'm going to begin by painting the eyes. Thankfully the necromancer appears not to have any iris or pupils, so all we need to do here is provide a small dab of off-white for each eye. For that, I'm once again using Vallejo's ivory. If things go wrong here, we can either wash the mistake away quickly with a wet brush, or simply paint over the area with some black and start over. Next, I'm going to paint the decorative horns. Although these could be left black, I've chosen to give them a more eye-catching gradient using the following colours, and I'll be starting by mixing some black with some Steel Legion Drab. I'm then going to use this to colour the lower two-thirds or so of each horn. I'm then following this with some pure Steel Legion Drab for the lower half. It's quite okay for us to produce a slightly grainy or striated texture whilst doing this. I'm then going to jump to some pure Screaming Skull for the tips of the horns. Another optional decorative touch might be to paint the stone or jewel on the belt. For this, I've chosen to try Citadel's technical paint, Spirit Stone Red. This is one of a set of glossy, semi-translucent paints designed to be painted over a metallic base colour, in this case, Skullcrusher Brass. So we begin by painting on the metallic brass colour. We then take some undiluted spirit stone red and simply spread it over the surface of the gemstone. The idea is that we actually want uneven coverage that allows the metallic tone beneath to shine through where the red is at its thinnest. Even if the application of this is not quite perfect, the finished result is still quite eye-catching. Next, I'm going to paint the red markings on the face and the ram skull, which we can presume to be dried blood. For this, I'm going to use some Mephiston Red, mixed with just a small amount of Caliban Green and some Xerius Purple. Here I'm adding the green, and now the purple. For the circle on the forehead, it's probably best to start small, and enlarge it later if need be. I'm then going to mix this with some Evil Sun Scarlet and brighten up the main spot of blood on the forehead, as well as that on the cheekbones. Next, I'll be painting the base using the same steps detailed in the previous episodes.
The only difference is that instead of using the quick shade, I'll be applying a mixture of Agrax Earthshade and Non Oil. Once we've applied a protective matte spray, we can then take a little gloss varnish, which I use really thin with a roughly equal amount of water, and use this to provide a gloss coat to the green bottles, as well as the gemstone. We could also use this to give a little emphasis to the highlighted parts of the armour. And we can also apply this to the horns. And this completes the Necromancer. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have enjoyed the video. With the Necromancer complete, I will soon be turning my attention to the base set heroes. As usual, my very special thanks go out to the legion of generous patrons who are funding this work. These videos simply wouldn't be possible without their support. Join me again soon, as we continue painting miniatures from Zombicide Black Plague. Happy painting!